All right. So welcome to our panelists on the Wikipedia campaigns panel for the Open Publishing Festival. Uh, I am pleased to have three excellent experienced Wikipedia and Wikimedians with me who have worked on a, a pretty interesting variety of projects designed to improve wiki content and help people learn to contribute to wikis. Uh, so why don't we just start off with some brief introductions. Uh, so I'm going to just call on you in the order I see you on my, my screen. First up, we have, uh, well, and, and so why don't you tell us your name? Uh, tell us what your, what your job is, what your work is, if it connects with, uh, with what you've done on Wikipedia, or if it doesn't, you don't have to go into that. And, um, and if you could uh, just state the, the name and uh, like one sentence of what your project is. So let's start with uh, Florence Devois. Ah, oh, we are not on the same order then. <laughs> okay, so my name is Florence Devoir. On Wikipedia, I'm known as Anter. It's a different name. I've been a Wikipedian since uh, the end of 2001. So it has been many, many years. So during all those years, I've really acted in many different capacities. I think I've probably done about everything except developing code. But... Um, well, so I've taken some responsibility in uh, the overarching uh, organization, which is Wikimedia Foundation as chair, uh, just after Jimmy Wales. I've funded um, several associations, including Wikimedia France, because I'm French, and Wiki in Africa. And today I'm here in, the, in my Wiki in Africa hat. And uh, the topic I've been focusing the past five years are related to women, gender, gender gap, and Africa, the Africa gap. And the project I would like to talk about is called Wiki Challenge École d'Afrique. In English, that, that is Wiki Challenge African Schools. And well, it's a school project. I'm not saying more for now. Okay, great. Uh, so Kevin Peiravi. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm hi. Kevin. I currently live in Dallas, Texas. I've been a Wikipedian since 2008. Uh, my daytime job is a software engineer and then Wikipedia, like most people, is my side hobby. Um, I've been all over the place. Currently, I'm involved with organizing stuff in Ohio as well as Wikimedia DC um, and Wikipedia Asian Month. Um, but the hat I'm wearing today for this panel is for Wiki Loves Monuments, which is a international competition that takes place every year. Uh, where people submit photos of historic sites um, from the locale. Um, and we'll discuss that more later, I'm sure. But that's Great. about it. All right, thank you. And Rosie Stevenson, good night. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. So I'm Rosie Stevenson, good night, coming to you from my home in Nevada City, California, a small town in the Sierra Nevada foothills. I'm retired now, but before being retired, I made a very lovely career in the healthcare industry on the administrative side, different jobs, contracts, and recruitment, and so forth. I've done a lot of different things in the wiki world. I became a Wikipedian in 2007 on the English Wikipedia and administrator in 2009. and I founded Wiki Project Women Writers in 2014, and I co-founded Wiki Project Women in Red, something that I'm going to be talking about more as we progress with this panel. Okay. Very good. I think we can see there's quite a variety of, uh, of different topics here. So I think, so I'm going to stay with the order that we just started with. Uh, Florence, I think your, your project is, uh, it's a bit of an outlier in terms of you know, the original idea of the panel was publishing on Wikipedia. And, mm -hmm. um, and so your, this, this particular project, it really caught my interest, even though it's not literally on Wikipedia, but I think there's mm -hmm. plenty that we can learn from your experience. So why don't, why don't you tell me a little bit more, what was the situation that you were trying to address mm -hmm. when you came up with the, with the project? What, what was the problem that you perceived? So this was a, a project we launched three years ago. And uh, three years ago, I, could uh, observe a, a collection of things. Uh, the first that Rosie will probably go more in depth with is the very limited content related to women. 
And if I cross that limited content on Wikipedia about women and the limited content on Wikipedia about Africa, we get some pretty interesting figure. And I'm going to give you just one. Right now, if, well, three years ago, when you were looking at the biographies on Wikipedia related to African women, it was, the total was 0.3% of all biographies we had. 0.3% which is, well, pretty interesting. The second thing is that if you look at um, Africa, about on, only about 20% of people were really online at that time. And many of them were not online for technical reasons. But as this proceeded, the fact is that even when they get online, they get online on their phone and they are only consumers. Most of them are only consumers. So I thought, could we have a way where we could involve these people who are not really completely online or who are just on the border of being online to get them online and start them being actors rather than simply consumers? In short, we want them to tell, them, to tell us stories about their country, about their culture, about the art in Africa. How could we get them online with us? And the, the, the idea behind this as well was that contrary wise to our American continent or European continent where I live, most African people are very young. Majority of the population there, 70% is below 20. So I thought, hey, what about trying somehow to build our next generation of Wikipedians? So there was a... Um, a a desire in two directions. One direction was we can find the editor's decline and we can get some more content about Africa. That's on one side. And on the other side, it's how could we actually get these kids who are on the border of being online, learn editing skills, learn digital skills, and be ready so that by the time they are 18, they can be full e-citizens. So that was the idea behind this, how could we mix that? So as you said, the project is not happening on Wikipedia. It's happening on Wikidia, which is a, a sort of sister project that is focusing on 12 to 17 years old. But it's the same platform than Wikipedia, that's the same pillar, the same concept, the same license, and most Wikidian are also Wikipedian. So it's a really a sort of a baby step for Wikipedia afterwards. And just one one detail, uh, you talked about this is for children. So what, what age group are you talking about? Uh, most of our children for us are between 11 to 14. Okay, excellent. So um, if I look at my target, it's 11 to 14, only French speaking students in about seven African countries, French speaking African countries. So typically that's Senegal, that's Mali, that's Cameroon, that's Cote d'Ivoire, those countries. Uh, and those are school children. The project is being run in school. Mm -hmm. All right, and there's one big difference with every single project run by Wikipedia is that these schools are not connected to the internet. So the challenge is how do we get them to do something to start editing and create Wikipedia article without being online. Yeah. Well, I think we'll have to let that question yep. hang in the air for a moment. Uh, yep. That's a fascinating, a fascinating uh, challenge for, for most of us to think about. So Kevin, what's, uh, tell us a little bit about Wiki Loves Monument, Monuments. And uh, was that, I know it's been around for a long time. Were you there from the beginning or you're running the chapter that's, uh, that's in the United States, but it didn't originate here, right? Yeah, so Wikilove's Monuments started back in, I believe, 2012, and it was actually only taking place in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, and the whole goal of the event was uploading photos of historic sites in the Netherlands. Um, so historic churches, historic buildings, anything that's pretty much registered as a historical site with the government. Um, and that was a great success that year. Um, and it was after that that they decided to take it international. Um, so I currently run the event within the United States, Wikilove's Monuments in the United States, and I've been doing it since 2016. Um, and the whole concept of Wikilove's Monuments is federated. So every nation has its own, every participating nation has its own organizers that run the event within that nation. 
and at the end of that contest, all the images are submitted up to the international jury that does an international contest. Okay. Um, and what's what's the what's sort of the overall goal of Wiki Wiki Loves Monuments? What is it like when you finish a campaign? So it's done on an annual basis. Yes. And at the end of every year, you're what? You're looking for a certain number of photographs that have been ad- uploaded, or are you looking at whether they've been added to Wikipedia articles, or what, how do, how do you think about your success? How do you measure success? Um, I think it, we can measure success very broadly by just saying that preserving cultural heritage is our primary goal. Um, and that surfaces with several different counts. So the first count is just numbers. How many sites can we get photographed? Here in the United States, for example, we are almost at having a photograph for every single location on the National Register of Historic Places, which is pretty great, somewhere like above 95%. Um, And that's been such a great success that we're actually, we in the United States accept photos now from sites that are registered on a local and state level, which is pretty exciting. Um, So that's one measurement. Another measurement is how many photos can we get onto Wikipedia articles? Um, So every year within the United States, for example, about 10% of the photos that are submitted are used on Wikipedia articles, as well as other Wikimedia projects. Um, 10% doesn't sound like a lot, but that translates to roughly around um, 500 to 1,000 photos every year, um, which is pretty sizable because let's say one image is being added to one article, that's hundreds of new articles that are being illustrated with these photos, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, And ultimately, it's just about having that preservation, right? Um, Especially around the world when you see places like recently in Syria, where we've seen historic sites um, being destroyed, um, and those sites will never be photographed again. How do we preserve that images in a free way? Wikipedia, these photos get uploaded and preserved and are free for anyone to use. And that's just a really noble goal, I think. Okay, and just one last follow up before I I move on to Rosie. Um, The, so clearly there is uh, a great impact on the community. Uh, I don't know how many new users, new photographers and contributors you draw in, but also there's the, just the, the activity among existing users. Is that something that you see as a core component or is that more of a side effect of your goal, which is more around just generating the content? I apologize. Can you repeat the last part? Yeah. Do you, I'm sorry. I didn't phrase that very well. Is that, so there's, on the one hand, there's the goal of generating content, which you just described, but yes. also there are benefits to the community in terms of bringing in new users and increasing connection among ex- or, or skills sharing among existing users. So do you think of those as sort of equal, equally important or is it really more focused on the content? Um, no, that's definitely a huge goal as well. Um, so for example, in 2018, Uh, We actually had in the United States over 1,900 users participate, which is actually the second highest of any country in the world. The only country that had more was India. And of those uploaders, over 90% were brand new to the project, which is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's 90% of uploaders who came to Wikipedia, saw the banner that said, upload your photos of historic sites. They went to the contest page and said, this looks like a noble goal I want to be a part of, and they uploaded their photos. Um, So it's a great way to get people engaged with the project. Um, One of the challenges we face is keeping them engaged, right? Because a very, very small minority of those users, once they upload their photos, will stick around and keep contributing. Um, I'd imagine it's somewhere in the low 10%. Um, But even just having the initial engagement, getting people to know that they can contribute to Wikipedia projects is pretty great. And we've also seen many users who contribute one year, even if they don't contribute throughout the rest of the year, they'll come back for the contest in the future. So we do have a good number of repeat contributors every year just from Ricky Loves Monuments, which is pretty great as well. Okay. Well, so let's uh, let's hear from our Women in Red about Women in Red. Rosie, what's the... What's the original problem you were trying to overcome? What did you do? So Women in Red is a community, a wiki project that's designed to, what we say, move the needle and improve the percentage of biographies on Wikipedia that are related to women, as well as articles that are related to women's works and women's issues broadly construed. Think things like suffrage and women's health and so forth. 
So when we started the project in 2015, it was based upon um, some information that we got at the end of 2014, when we saw the first research study, academic research study, that gave us a number. And that number was 15.5% of the biographies on Wikipedia were about women. We didn't have a goal to improve that number to something like 50%, 49, 51, 33, 20, nothing. No goal other than we knew we could do better if there was some kind of a concerted effort to make a change. And the way to make that concerted effort was to let people know. In fact, most people just don't know that there's a problem regarding the quote unquote content gender gap, all the missing articles related to women's biographies, women's works, women's issues. But the more we worked on this issue, the more we learned that there are these different layers, like peeling back an onion um, regarding this, this issue of the content gender gap. And really the biggest part of this at the center of it, the core of it is society. Because if society doesn't write about women, we're not going to have references that we can use to create these articles. So think back 500, 1,000, 2,000, 2,500 years ago, there were still a lot of male generals, male politicians, male men of the cloth, and people were writing articles about those people because we have the references. We'll never be able to catch up. There's no way to retroactively go back and create women generals and politicians and men of the cloth dating back to all those years. So we can only fast forward to a place in time where women's presence was recorded. And, and by doing so, we need to look very carefully to find those references, which initially are going to be few and far between. But more interestingly, the Wikimedia Foundation did a research project in 2019 and came up in this pilot study of last year with some staggering numbers. And that is that in 2019 in their studies, they found that 70% um, of the people who were reading Wikipedia, reading, across a, a several different languages, about a dozen, are, seven, are the age of 30%, 30 years and younger. 70% of the respondents are under the age of 30. And three quarters of the readers are male. So in order to become an editor, first you've got to be a reader. You've got to know about Wikipedia. You've got to read about Wikipedia. And if only 25% of the people who are reading Wikipedia are women, maybe we need to kind of start there and expose more women in all sorts of different places, not just focused on uh, United States or UK or privileged parts of North America, expose them to Wikipedia and give them a chance to be able to read about it. Because then we go into other kinds of numbers where we look at who's actually editing Wikipedia. We know that 77% of Wikipedia articles are written by 1% of Wikipedia editors. And then we know that um, only 12.6% of Wikipedia editors were women, according to the United Nations University study of 2010. The 2011 editor survey done by the Wikimedia Foundation said that only 8.5% of the contributors are women. We know that in the 2018 survey that the Wikimedia Foundation did, 4,000 participants in it, they came back, the foundation said 9% of the editors are women. So it's no wonder that only 15.5% of the articles were about women back in 2015. But because of the concerted effort from the community all around the world, working from their on their home computers, not having to attend an in-person event, working from anywhere, we've been able to manage to move the needle to 18.44% of the biographies just on English Wikipedia are now about women. 
And that doesn't take into account that this is a project in many languages. About 25 different versions of Wikipedia have the, a project called Women in Red or something that works for them. For example, in French language, it's called Les Sans Pages or the missing pages, if you will. Without pages. Yes. So we've been able to show that by having concerted effort, we're able to make a change. I want to just draw your attention here real quick before we move on to the next person, what this can mean. In 2012, Emily Templewood uh, created something called Wiki Project Women Scientists. And when the Women Scientists pages were first tagged in that year, 2012, they tagged 106 biographies. And now, Fast forward to April 2020, last month, there are 11,000 biographies within Wiki Project Women Scientists. In 2013, Sarah Sturge created Wiki Project Women Artists, and that first year, when they tagged the, all the articles that fell under its scope, there were 1,600 women artist biographies. Fast forward to last month, April 2020, there are now more than 13,000 biographies within that scope. And then in 2014, as I mentioned earlier, I created Wiki Project Women Writers. When we first tagged um, all the articles in that first weekend, we found 45 biographies <laughs> within our scope. And now fast forward, April 2020, there are 36,000 biographies with, within the scope. And all this goes to prove that if you shine a light on a project, if you let people know that there's an issue, people can do some amazing things if they just know that there's a problem. They try to solve it. And just, just, to, just to dig into that one a little bit, um, clearly that indicates a tremendous number of articles and biographies being written, but also some of that I would think would, would be articles being identified that should have been on the list that just hadn't previously been tagged. Yes? Absolutely. No? Yeah. And, and we look back it's at, It's probably a little know, difficult I, to know exactly how much, but. No, we yeah, do know. Oh, okay, good. We've, yeah, we, we do know. We have the numbers. For example, with Women in Red, it was founded in September 2014. I said 45 articles, but 12 months later, September 2015, it was 22,900. And then it became uh, 36,900 in April 2020. The numbers for women artists in its first year, it was 1,600, and then 4,800, and 6,400, and 8,100, and now 13,000. And for women scientists, it was 108, and 12 months later, 1,600, and 12 months later, 2,700, and 12 months later, 4,500, and now it's about 12,000. So we actually um, have bots that have done a pretty good job, maybe not a perfect job, of identifying all the articles within just these three wiki projects, but they do a pretty good job, and it sure beats trying to count them by hand. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And just one, one other detail, just uh, because I think many of our audience may not be Wikipedians. There's a specific reason why you chose Women in Red, just to have that on the record in here. What's the, what's yes, the title mean? There is. So on Wikipedia, you can click between articles by clicking on the blue links. The blue links take you down this rabbit hole from one article to the next. But if you see a red colored link on Wikipedia and you click it, it takes you to nothing. It means there's no article. That's the red link. So Women in Red is about all those red linked articles about women that are missing articles. That's right. Ergo, Women in Red. Yeah, they need to be still written. All right. Thank you. So uh, I, I think... Uh, I'd, I'd like to go back to Florence. Uh, I think that yours might be the most, um, the most crafted, the most uh, centrally managed project of these in terms of, I mean, you went, it's, it's almost like a client relationship. I think the way that you're describing it, you're going to a school and you're offering them a service of you're helping them to bring their students into a kind of activity that, that's unfamiliar to them. So how, how, did, how did you go about designing that? I see, maybe I haven't characterized yeah. it right. How, how did uh, you go about designing this project and, and making sure that it 
had yeah, some good I, results. I need, to ex- I need to explain that a little yeah. bit. Just wanted to give a, fig- uh, uh, a few figures because I was so impressed by Rosie's figures. <laughs> <laughs> just, I, need, I need to give you just one figure I think was very interesting. It was um, from a study from the Oxford Institute just back a, a few years ago and showed that we had more edits coming every single month from Hong Kong than from the entire African continent. And that means that one of our big, big, big problem in our uh, setup is that we cannot rely on Wikipedian volunteers uh, that could organize events. If you ask me, do I have in my pocket a Wikipedian that would host a training session in say, I don't know, Lesotho? I don't know. I have no name to suggest. And back in 2014, I had no names to suggest in more than half of Africa. So how can you organize something where you do not even know one African being a Wikipedian in that area of the world? How can you do that in particular when you do not either have access to the schools since they are not connected to the internet? I live in Marseille, Marseille is in France. So how would I do that? It's impossible. So the only way to do that is first to have partners. So contrary-wise to the other projects such as Women in Red or to Wikilove's Monument, we absolutely, absolutely mandatorily need to have local partners to, to, to do the go-between. So when I set up the project, I looked for a partner for this, and the partner I found was the Fondation Orange. So Orange is the communication company. There is a, a rather small foundation operating um, and these people, they are working very, very hard to help promote uh, effective ICT skills through training and education and so on. And a few years ago, they started dist- having a, a sort of school network. So, the, so in several countries, they selected schools that they thought um, were somehow mature enough so that they could get to the next step. So they distribute them some tablets and some Raspberry Pi, which are are some small portable uh, servers, um, very light, not so sturdy, we hope so, not too expensive, that can be plugged in uh, in the school in electricity, and then you can have access to a bunch of resources which are hosted on this server. So the bunch of resources, who would guess? What do you think they are? Well, mostly open education resources that have been collected over time everywhere in the world. Many of them come from uh, the set that is proposed by Kiwix. So for people who do not know, Kiwix is uh, a little association in Switzerland. And what they started doing first is to create some offline versions of Wikipedia, portable versions that you could take with you and, and distribute in places without access to the internet. So they created offline versions of Wikipedia and then offline versions of Wikidia or of many other things. They tried to aggregate all these resources. So what Orange did was to actually provide these tablets and little servers on which there was resources. And guess what happened? Well, most of those things, they stayed in the locket. because yeah, it's precious, because maybe it's fragile, because teachers are very hesitant to use such resources because they do not even themselves really know how to use them. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite sad because they have some resources, but they do not use them. So it sounds and like often, really the crucial resource is maybe something human, right? Is the it, person it, to show them how to use absolutely. it and to encourage them. Yeah, and absolutely. that's what you can provide. So they, they, they needed a way to somehow encourage people to <laughs> move on yeah. and maybe be supported and maybe also show them that they are not, as I was saying earlier, not just consumers, but maybe they could also participate in the creation of these resources themselves. That was super, super important. Yeah. And at some point, because of all the activities I had as part of Work in Africa, I was meeting that problem all the time of uh, very tiny small groups of Wikipedians emerging in Africa, but 
trying at some point to organize an editathon, a training session, or even a presentation of Wikipedia, everything is ready. They have the room, they have the participants, they have even the display system, and even the electricity, and maybe even the climate, uh, well, you know, the, the system for the heater, and what's the name? Forgot the name. Air conditioner. Air conditioner. Everything is ready, and at the last minute, internet is not there. And yeah. they cannot even show them how it works, how a wiki works. So we thought, what could we do so that these people, even if at some point they don't have internet access, they are not just, well, let's have a coffee then, because there is nothing left to do. So instead, we developed a system that is a, a software platform that looks like Wikipedia, that smells like Wikipedia, that you, everything, but it's not Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And it's working on this little uh, Raspberry Pi, this little server. So you can put it in your pocket, you get to your meeting, and if at the last moment there is no internet, you still have the solution of getting this little box from your, out of your pocket, plug it, plug it in, it creates a small Wi-Fi network that is about the size of a big room, of a classroom typically and you put some resources there and the platform that looks like wikipedia and you can at least do a training session on how to use and edit a wiki and you oh, can excellent. create some content being offline okay. right yeah so i wanted to develop this this tool and i happened to talk to fondation orange saying well just the, the regular question uh, would you agree to fund that thing because I need some funding to pay the developers to do it and so on. Mm -hmm. And they say, we are super, super, super interested by this system because it could be a solution that we could add on our own boxes in our school networks. Mm -hmm. So that was a deal. And that was a very precious thing we could set up because we had a win-win situation there. Yeah. They already had a, net, a school network that was growing every year. So I'm not entirely sure how many schools they have to hold together. For my project, we didn't go to every single school. It would be too complicated. Uh, we currently have about a hundred schools involved in this. So they know these schools, they have access to the schools through a facilitator who is often a member of a local NGO, not a Wikipedia, just a, a member of the local NGO, going to the schools, uh, adding literally Wikifundi that's the name of the platform, onto their system, trying to move all these tablets and the Raspberry Pi out of the lock and putting them on the table and, guy, let's do something about that. But we needed another incentive. And this incentive is why would they actually go on this platform and try to write an article? They, they needed a reason to do that. So we set up a challenge, a writing challenge, so Wiki Challenge is an encyclopedic writing challenge that takes place over about six months' time. Okay. And these kids from 11 to 14, they have to write articles about their surroundings. So it can be okay. a local culture uh, thing. It can be um, a geographical spot, such as a river or a mountain. If they have some cultural artifacts, it can be about cultural artifacts, or it could be about a, lo a notable celebrity in their countries. So usually they will write about this on Wikifundi if they do not have internet, directly on Wiki Wikidia if they had internet, which is usually yeah. not the case. And the local facilitator is the one doing the go-between. Yeah. Right? Excellent. So, it's, okay, a, so it's a process that when other people, for example, if Rosie tries to organize an editathon somewhere in New York, I don't remember where you live, you said Minnesota. California. California, yep. you're in California. You want to set up an editathon, you can do it that on, you call everyone one week before, yeah, you, you do the editathon on internet, Saturday, no yeah. and by Saturday, everything is online. For us, this process takes about six months. Mm. So it's very, very long, but world from, yeah. very, very, yeah. very slow, but it happens. It works. Yeah, it's wonderful. So I want to pick up on this, uh, this question of a challenge, because that's really, that's very much at the core of the Wiki Loves Monuments concept, isn't it? Kevin, could you, could you uh, tell us what a challenge looks like in, in a project like yours, where you're dealing with people in the United States who don't have the internet issues and where you're both dealing with 
existing Wikipedians and people who haven't contributed before? What's, how does a challenge help and what does yours look like? Yeah, uh, so the whole premise, um, the whole marketing, I guess, behind Wiki Those Monuments is that we call it a photography contest. Um, so every nation, for the most part, will select their top 10 winners from their contributors. Um, and usually the top 10 winners will get a certificate and either all 10 of the winners or maybe like a top three or five will get a prize. Um, and the prize is usually either um, like a gift card or maybe some um, photography gear, like even a new camera, um, things like that. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, it's actually a very small number of contributors that get prizes because, as I mentioned, we have thousands of contributors every year, but only a few winners. Um, but it's enough that people get really interested and kind of gives like a nice, fun, competitive um, feeling. Um, and where do and those what, prizes come from? Do you have sponsors? What's the... What's the uh, the Wikimedia model? Foundation, actually, they fund this project and they've been big supporters since the beginning, um, which is pretty great. Um, now, one might think being a photography contest that professional photographers automatically have the upper edge, um, which they do have an advantage, of course. Um, but what I've noticed is that we do a pretty good job of kind of having our winners be a very diverse selection from all sorts of skill sets. Um, the winner this year for Wikios Monuments in the, United, uh, in the United States, for example, was actually taken on an iPhone, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, and I think just kind of stems from the fact that we look for a lot more than just pure photo quality. We also take into consideration things like, is this a site that hasn't been um, photographed before? Or is it a unique perspective? Or is it something that has um, exceptional value on the encyclopedia? Um, so we look for more than just pure um, technical quality, which I think makes the contest more exciting and accessible for more people. Have those um, criteria shifted over the years? Do they sort of grow as the perception of what's needed grows? Or is it has it been a very consistent standard? They do shift, yeah. So actually, the first year I ran the contest in, in the United States in 2016, we noticed we had a a lot of submissions of places like uh, the Washington Monument, and a good chunk of the winners were also sites that like everyone knew. Um, and we realized then that we wanted to kind of like diversify the set and kind of bring to light sites that people might have not seen before. Um, because the whole point of this contest is to kind of preserve all historical sites, not just a select few. Um, so this is when we started introducing the criteria of we're going to try to prioritize um, sites that aren't well known or sites that haven't been photographed before. Um, and many other regions and countries also do similar um, criteria like that. And we, every year we kind of revisit and see how we can adjust it and tweak it to kind of make things more clear or kind of prioritize certain aspects. But. And do you find, uh, so it seems to me in the, at the campaigns that I've run that some people are, like you say, very, very motivated by even a small prize, just the idea of winning a prize. Other people don't care at all. Is that sort of, is that your, like, are there people who participate just for the sake of participating and aren't really all that interested in whether they win a prize? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that especially holds true because like I said, it's only yeah. a very small number of people that win. Um, so people wouldn't keep coming back if they knew like there's a small chance of winning, um, which I think is pretty great as well. Um, and in the end, I think people just really like seeing the winners every year, right? And so they contribute to a contest and then they see the outcomes of that. And it's just kind of a con fun They feel like a community part of it even if, they didn't, yeah. even if they didn't win themselves. Yeah, yeah exactly. Excellent. Okay, so let's, I, I wanted to ask, um, generally, uh, if people want to participate in these campaigns, and I think this is probably, well, I, I'm interested in hearing from all of you. I expect Kevin and Rosie, yours are probably the ones that are broadly make sense for people to contribute to, uh, since Florence, yours is very specific. Uh, but uh, yeah, what, Kevin, what's, what, what's the best way, when does it happen and how do people get involved? And how do you get the message out to them apart from a, a video conference like this? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so every year in September, during the whole month of September is we kill those monuments. Um, so people can contribute photos of historical sites all throughout the month of September, and the photos don't have to be taken that month. Um, so if you have photos of a historical site from 10 years ago, you can go ahead and upload it as long as it's in that month of September. Um, and in terms of getting the word out, it's actually pretty simple. Um, we have a banner that goes at the top of Wikipedia and other Wikimedia sites. Um, that lasts for the duration of the month. Um, so anyone that visits Wikipedia will see this banner and that's millions of page views um, a week, if not per day. Um, 
and it's a simple manner, just says contribute your photos of historic sites and win prizes, something to that effect. Um, and that's the major draw. Um, so this year, for example, or last year, I should say, in 2019, uh, we had 7,000 participants internationally. Um, 2018 was actually the second highest with the, uh, almost 14,000 participants. Um, so it's a very effective method. Um, we also do things like reach out to last year's participants to invite them as well and do outreach to some like photography groups. But all of that is like very small compared to the number that the banner brings in. Okay. So Rosie, uh, I think writing a Wikipedia article is one of the, I, I mean, I've found in, in, in all the outreach that I've done around Wikipedia and a lot of other people have confirmed it's one of the hardest things to do on Wikipedia, right? I mean, there's, it's one thing to fix a typo. You know, uploading a photo might be a little bit more complicated, but you can follow the steps and you can upload a photo. That, but to actually write an article from start to finish, that's kind of a big job. So how do you get people who've never edited Wikipedia before or haven't delved in too much to, to take the plunge and start a whole new article and be successful with it? Well, a couple of things about that. First of all, we don't care what your gender is. We say, just write the frickin' article. And I think that that's a um, very powerful message and has led to our success. Because if we had focused only on some subgroup of humans to be writing these articles, um, you know, we wouldn't have gotten to where we are. Yeah. Well, and I, if I be, could just interject on that, I, you know, because I, I remember when I was working for the Wikimedia Foundation in 2010, which is about the time when there really started to be a very focused concern around the gender gap among editors. Mm -hmm. And really it was, it was years from 2010, you started in 2015, you said with this? Uh -huh. yep. I mean, it was five years before someone had the idea and it was you and Roger Bamkin, I guess, were the, uh, exactly. were the right yeah. to, to put the focus somewhere else. And it's not to say that one's a problem and the other isn't, but I mean, from my perspective as someone who was around the edges, that was something that I was very concerned about, but it was also something I felt like I didn't have much opportunity to influence. I can't by editing, I can't improve the gender gap of editors. I'm doing the opposite, right? I can try to recruit people, but that's challenging. But, but with the idea of writing an article, suddenly there's something that literally anyone can do to take a bite out of the problem. I think maybe because, just as you said, the two co-founders, Roger and I, represent two genders. Yep. And we recognize from the start the, the importance of, you know, this is an issue. This is everyone's issue. This isn't a woman's issue, this missing um, content gender gap. This isn't just something that women should focus on. This is society. Everyone should, should understand that there's an issue and help with the focus on that. The other part of this is that there are different events and different communities and different groups around the world in all different languages that focus on training people on how to edit. So one of the things Women in Red doesn't have to focus on so much is the teaching. Yeah. We're not about come together in uh, Paris, London, um, or anywhere else in the world and sit together as a group and write these biographies. We're all about do this from the comfort of your own home. Hopefully you're around other Wikipedians at your university or at your coffee shop, where if you have a specific question, they can help you and get the answer to it. But once you know the rudiments of how to edit Wikipedia, we have several, I think, eight essays specific to things you should know about writing women's um, biographies. And then once you get started and you actually have created the start of an article, there's no such thing as a finished article on Wikipedia, right? There is always room for improvement. So as long as you have meet the notability requirements, the reliable sources requirements, there are others who can work to improve it. In fact, there's a wiki project for that. It's called Women in Green. That project works on improving articles. Women in Red focuses on creating yeah. the new articles. And we have a very vibrant talk page, a harassment-free zone on Wikipedia, where people bring links to the draft articles they've created or the stub articles they've created to draw attention to that work and ask for help from veterans who might be able to um, 
explain where you could what you yeah. could do to improve it or actually provide you with references you know we have a, a librarian in, in residence who helps with resources so um I think that's the reason for the success of yeah. Women in Red is that you can be anywhere, you can be anyone. You don't have yeah. to disclose who you are, what your gender is. You can be of any gender and you're welcome. Just create the articles and we're there then to help with the veteran um, writers to improve those articles along the way. Okay. And just to, just to make sure that our audience gets some real specific foothold for, because I think we'll have people watching this who've maybe never edited Wikipedia and aren't very familiar with it. If someone is, is excited to get involved and join forces with Wiki and Red, what's, what's one thing that they could do to get on the train? Well, here we go. I'm gonna circle around and hopefully you can see, I don't know if you can see the page now. Wiki Project Women in Red, we have a short, URL. I don't know. Is it clearly visible, or maybe you Not, can put it up on your? No. Yeah, <laughs> I think we can. I think we can share the link. Um, maybe when we go on to uh, to the next speaker, maybe you can put it in our chat, and then we can make sure that yeah. it's uh, that it's available to. Uh, so, but tell us what the link is. It's the so this is the main wiki project page for women. Yeah, in there's yeah. wiki. Uh, so when they go, what should they do when they get there? Do they sign up? their name on a list? Do they ask a question? What's the... You can do several things. You can become a member. You can write a note on the talk page, or you can read the uh, essays about how to focus on women's biographies. Just saying hello on the talk page. You know, we have hundreds of talk page stalkers, they're called, yeah. who'll be there to welcome you and to give you suggestions if you have Stalker questions is a rather start. Yeah, a sounding word, isn't it? <laughs> but it's not, it doesn't have that, that negative though, connotation. On Wikipedia, it's a positive thing. Yeah. A page stalker is someone who's watch listed a certain page. Yeah. So we're there to help. All right, great. So Florence, are, are there any ways that uh, that people all around the world could support an effort like yours? Or uh, just before answering this yeah. question, I would just throw a little idea in the pot about women in red. Um, I wonder to which point it was uh, positive that Wikidata was created because Wikidata allowed us probably to create lists of missing women much more easily than before. So I think it probably had a, a big role in, in the launch of Women in Red, even if I was not there. So I don't know what motivated you in the first place, but it struck me that this was soon after the creation of Wikidata. Well. I have to say that without Wikidata, we wouldn't be as successful as we are too. So I'm glad you brought that up, Florence. The main message behind this is that for all the articles that are being written, unless you can identify the ones that haven't been written, that need to be written, you're kind of at a yeah. standstill. And so that's one thing Women in Red, uh, I think, does as well as writing the articles. Mm -hmm. It's created something close to 800 lists of missing women. Now, some of these lists are what we call crowdsourced. In other words, anyone, you or me, your next door neighbor, your aunt, your uncle, can add names to these crowdsourced lists by occupation, by geography, by university, and so forth. Mm -hmm. We have Wikidata generated lists that use a bot. We have uh, dictionary-based lists. We have web-based lists. For example, every year in November, the BBC publishes a list of the BBC 100 women. And so we will take that list from a URL and we'll create such a list so that those missing articles, someone can get started on them. But the best of the lists are generated through Wikidata using a Sparkle query. Yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, otherwise, to, to answer your question, Pete, um, even though there is this disconnection element, we actually have many Wikipedians helping uh, at the beginning of the project and at the end of the project. For example, when we collect all the content, and that might probably be very scary for, for the other uh, Wikipedians, but when we collect the content, we cannot attribute it. It has been written by a group of unknown kids in an unknown school somewhere in a faraway country. And it cannot be attributed to one person. There's no chance of that. 
it will be attributed to the poor Wikipedian who will, in the end, ultimately upload it on the project. And what is amazing is that several months later, when a new archive of offline content resources is being created by Kiwix, and then it is being sent to the schools again. And maybe one year, one year and a half after creating the article, they will see their article being published on this offline archive. So it takes a long time to do this round turn. But this round ter turn can only happen because we have facilitators. So there's a, a key element here that's at the same time a strength and a weakness. We need those facilitators who are online, who are on, in contact with me, who are in contact with the Wikipedians and can also be in contact with the schools. These very precious people, I need to find them all yeah. the time. In every new country, I need to find this person. So I have a few cases where I found a Wikipedian willing to do it. That's the case, for example, in Cameroon. Cameroon George is the, from the Cameroon user group and he's the one doing this traveling thing. Mm -hmm. So what has been great in this case is he knows Wikipedia, he knows the wikis, he knows this, all this, this um, word this community, so he can truly speak to the schools with the, this full knowledge. But I have many other cases where I cannot find anyone. So I have to rely on uh, someone with lots of goodwill, but no knowledge whatsoever yeah. of Wikipedia, no knowledge of li licenses, no knowledge of anything. So I have to train these people in advance. And here again, I have two big options. I cannot go to this, all these countries to train the people. That would cost too much. Mm -hmm. Plus, in, right now, we can't do that anymore anyway. But we have two main options. Either I train them online through webinars, chat, WhatsApp, any, any system to try to explain them how it works. Or I succeed to find a person somewhere in the country who can teach them. And I had the case, uh, for example, in Tunisia, because there is a Wikimedia Tunisia group, and th there's a person, Afek, in this user group, who agreed to train the facilitator, and a year later to do a feedback and train him again, and so on. So it's a, something, a process that is in, improving every single year. And some of these facilitators, they become Wikipedian themselves. So little by little, steps by steps, we improve the whole system and maybe we grow from no one in the country to one person to a little group and maybe later to a user group. So it doesn't mean that people cannot get involved. If you live yeah. in such a, one of those countries, if you're interested, well, get in, in touch with me. Maybe we can find something that we can do together. Excellent. Okay, well, we are... Um... We're just a few minutes from the end of our hour. Um, I do want to encourage if we have any questions either among the panel or uh, attendees want to add them, add, feel free to add it to the chat window or for the panelists, just speak up. Um, I just have one final question. Um, and you know, if I, th I think this might be a rather brief answer. So uh, you know, this should leave a little time if we have any, any further questions after that. But it's, if, if someone, for, for the Wikipedians in our audience, for people who might be interested in designing a campaign like yours, if they're, if they're wanting to reach out to schools in a remote part of the world um, to help children understand Wikipedia, or if they're trying to design a, a photography campaign or uh, something to fill in a gap in Wikipedia's content, what could they learn from your project? What's, what's one simple thing that they could learn uh, and or you know, a link that they might be able to read if they wanted to get into more depth? Um, so, Rosie, why don't we start with you? If you're ready, you look, you're thinking, <laughs> is there someone who wants to jump in? Um, let me say that I think the, the way you'd get started is just reading Wikipedia and clicking through some of the articles that interest you where you think you might want to write an article of that type so that you kind of learn what does an article look like? What would be the first sentence of an article? What are those things called headers? And do I really need something like that? What are those categories at the bottom of an article? And, oh, I can see how they're helpful because they put certain articles together and they help me to see other 
19th century Nigerian women writers, for example, and I can see how many are missing, or I can see that there's a lot in that category. So I think you start as a reader, and you learn from those particular articles kind of how to edit, and where do you need that reference? If you see that in 10 articles, you have a reference after every significant fact, then you should know that when you write an article, if you write a significant fact, you should have a reference after that sentence or at the end of that paragraph and so forth. So I think start by reading and that'll teach you kind of what you need when you start editing. Okay. So, and I think uh, the, the other dimension of the question too is like, suppose, and I, I may not have uh, phrased this very clearly, but I'm thinking at this point more of the, uh, of the experienced Wikipedian who's wanting to start a campaign that's similar to Women in Red. Ah. So if they, if they have an interest in making sure that Wikipedia's article about cancer are up to speed and they want to recruit thousands of volunteers to work on Wikipedia's articles about cancer, what could they learn from the Wiki in Red campaign about how to effectively do that? Yeah. For us, it's all about lists, like I had yeah. mentioned earlier. So identify the um, gaps. Identify yeah. the gaps. Identify the articles that are stubs that need to be improved identify the missing articles, the red links, if you will, so that people know kind of where to start. If you're yeah. a veteran Wikipedian and you don't need any help with the training, you just need to know where to start. And in, in the case of if it's COVID-19 pandemic or it's cancer, where is the list of the articles that we that want to, to focus written. on? And, you know, we do this in all sorts of ways in other campaigns, um, environment mm -hmm. and Earth Day, those kinds of things um, we've done in the last couple of weeks. But if it's something serious like COVID-19, there's a project, a wiki project for that. So identify the articles that we want to focus our attention on, the missing images that might be associated with the project so people know where to go looking for images that need to be added to articles and so forth. Sounds like you're sort of providing a bunch of different footholds that different kinds of people might be able to, one person might be a photographer, another might be a writer, another might be a copy editor type. A right, or a librarian. Yeah. yeah, a librarian who's going to add the references. Yeah. Um, starting off with some kind of a main page, a meetup page, if you will, that okay. itemizes the work that needs to be done and giving people a lot of different um, examples yeah. of where to jump in. 50 articles, not five, okay. um, will help with the veterans okay. if you're running a campaign. So Kevin, how about, uh, how about if someone wanted to start a photo campaign specifically? Uh, yeah, similar to... Um... Rosie's project, um, it's all about lists, right? Um, yep. So for Wikilos Monuments, we have dozens and dozens of tables that list all the different historical sites by state, uh, even by city. Um, we also have maps.wikilosmonuments.org um, where people can go to have a visual map to find historical sites near them. Um, if you want to start a Wikilos Monuments campaign, which you can, for example, if it's not happening in your country, you can do so. Um, and you would just want to reach out to one of the existing organizers and we'd love to help you out with that. Um, otherwise, if you're looking at exploring other types of um, campaigns, like either a Wikilos photo campaign or something else, that's definitely possible as well. Um, note that after Wikilos Monuments, we've also seen other photo campaigns like Wikilos Loves, Wikilos Folklore, um, Wikilos Earth, uh, the list goes on. Um, so if you have some other topic that you want to explore organizing, that's certainly possible as well. Um, it's just all about producing that list, uh, producing the infrastructure to track contributions um, on Wikipedia that takes form in, like, in the form of um, categories. So when someone uploads a photo to Wikilow's Monu Wiki Monuments, it's automatically tagged with Wikilow's Monuments in the United States in this year so that we can easily track them. Um, once you have all that set up, it kind of just can take place on its own. Um, people will jump in and start contributing. As Rosie said, once you shine a light on a problem, people will dive in and start making contributions. Um, and a nice thing about Wikilow's Monuments is that we have a huge network of um, organizers in dozens of countries. So if you need help, you can always reach out to um, one of that, them. That human network is, yeah. is so valuable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, Florence, I think you'll have the last word. Uh, we're right up towards the end here. So what's yeah. if someone wanted to, to do something a little more structured like yours? What would, how do you Should approach a school? Two things. First, uh, I would suggest, uh, I would promote Wiki Loves Africa, which is also a photographic contest. But contrary wise to most of the others, we have no lists. And we have no lists because there are so many gaps 
that it's really not a problem finding the gap. You just add something, it's part of the gap. So it's fine. We are not yet uh, <laughs> floated with so many images that we can, we really have any interest in doing this. Maybe in a couple of years, but not yet. No, my, my personal main recommendation is, is to look for partners. Uh, for projects such as mine, um, a project in areas where there are few contributors, there are some very interesting partnerships to set up, typically with uh, other associations in the open source movement, such as OpenStreetMap. Uh, there are interesting partnerships to have with uh, associations focusing on digital skills, uh, technological coding, um, in particular, girls in girls associations related to tech. I'm not going to mention names. Uh, and there's also some very interesting partnership to make with uh, groups such as the Goethe Institute. Um, we have been working with the Goethe Institute in the past, but there are others similar. Uh, because they all located in those countries, very often they have, uh, they have uh, places, they have buildings, they have meeting rooms, they have internet, they have computers, and they are more than happy to host us and to work with us. There's really a lots of goodwill. So we, uh, when we set up projects, in particular in Africa, it's very important to go look around for other type of partners and Wikipedians. There are yeah. not enough Wikipedians that we can rely only on them. When one uh, guy other is organizations alone, clearly bring yeah, different when kinds one of guy skills is, and resources. There's only two people they want to participate to Wikilove's monument in an African country. There are only two of them. It's very hard to do. But if they work with the other associations, they can do way more. So it's, it's important before you start something to look around what is being done by the other association and which one you could work with. That would really be my advice. Well, this has been wonderful. Uh, I, I think the end of our hour has come very quickly. Uh, I have plenty of questions I'd love to keep asking you, but I think we should keep this to our original plan. Uh, so I'm going to bid farewell to our panelists, but uh, we will assemble the links to the things they were discussing, and we'll be sure to post that on the video online. So if you want to delve in more or get in touch with them, you should have plenty of opportunities to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pete, and thank you for the others. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.